Today's Daf, Daf Tzadi Gimel, is sponsored Lilu Nishmas, Esther Bas Tzvi Hersh. Anybody interested in sponsoring the Daf, click on the link below for more information. Today we conclude the adages of the Chachomim begun on yesterday's Daf. One who follows the wealthy will pull away pieces of fat, meaning those who associate with the rich, some of their wealth will rub off on them. Asking judgment for a grievance to the heavenly court. One who seeks justice by bringing a grievance directly to Hashem is punished for his sins first unless he has no legal recourse in an earthly court. As a matter of fact, this happened to Sari Menu. She brought her grievances towards Avraham, who she claimed prayed mainly to have children, but not enough to have a child with her. He did not speak up when Hagar spoke disrespectfully. Since she could have brought her grievance to the court of shame, or to Avram Avinu directly, she died before Avram. It is wrong because a heavenly judgment takes into consideration the spiritual state of the complainer, or it could be that the judgment would be harsher. One should not minimize a curse even of an ordinary person. When Avimelech gave Sari Menu a large gift to remove any doubt of her guilt, he used the term Hineloch Ksus Enayim. Chazal explained the term as meaning, you caused me anguish by hiding the truth from me, so your children should not be able to see. Yitzchak became blind in his old age. Escaping or confronting a pursuer. One should be pursued rather than be a pursuer. The Gemara proves this from pigeons and doves, birds that cannot defend themselves and are fit for the altar. Mishnah, one who requests another to blind him or cut off a limb with no liability is liable. One who requests another to damage his property with no liability is exempt. Now, what's the reason for this distinction? Number one, the Gemara says, it's a begam mishpacha. Physical injury is a disgrace to one's family. Second reason the Gemara gives is one cannot take seriously a waiver for permanent injury as opposed to inflicting pain on a person. It could be that one would waver one's liability. The third reason the Gemara gives is the context of saying yes and no affects one's sincerity. Here the victim makes a request, blind me. The perpetrator responds, without liability, the victim responds yes as a question, whereas responding no concerning property damage would be sarcastic, meaning of course you are not liable. Question. Our Mishnah says that if the owner requests one to break his utensil, he is liable, unless he says without liability. How can the damager be liable? The Torah's liability for a custodian to guard an object given to him is only when it's given to him for that purpose, to watch it, to guard it, not to break it. The Gemara answers it depends how the custodian received it. If he took possession of the article before the request to destroy it, the request cannot be taken seriously unless the owner stated without liability. If he was given permission to destroy the object before taking possession of the item, then we can assume the owner does not really care that much about it. Here's an interesting din, liability for losing charity. The Gemara says if the allocation is a specific amount to specific people, then the Gabay Tzedakah is a custodian. If the money is to be distributed freely to any pauper, then we do not view it as a deposit by each pauper, but we view it as money not deposited and one is not liable. That finishes Parakachovel. Now we're beginning the Paragoizalatsi. The Mishnah says, and in an introduction to the mission, in fact, the verse in the Torah concerning theft teaches us an interesting law. The Torah says, asher gozal. The apparent redundancy of the words asher gozal teaches that he has to return what he stole. He is not required to return the improvements. Therefore, if he stole wood and made a chair, wool and made a garment, he pays its value at the time of the theft. If he stole a pregnant cow that gave birth, or a ewe laden with fleece that he sheared, he pays the value of a cow ready to give birth, or a ewe ready to be shorn. He pays the difference in value between a pregnant cow and one not pregnant, 
but acquires the calf that underwent the change from a fetus to a calf. If the cow became pregnant or the ewe laden in the thief's possession, he pays their value at the time of the theft. According to Rashi, he returns the cow or the ewe, but he keeps the calf. The difference between a thief who planed wood, whitened wool, or stole planed wood to build a chair, or stole spun thread to make a garment. The Torah law limits a Kenyan gazela to irreversible changes, such as planing wood. Rabbinic law extends it to reversible changes, such as even stealing planed wood and building a chair, in spite of the fact that he can remove the nails from the wood, and the Chachomim did this to encourage the thief to return the stolen item. Another possible way of understanding our Mishnah is that it refers only to irreversible changes such as planing wood into a pestle or wool into felt, which is pressing the raw material together. However, whitening wool, as an example, would also be a Kenyan even though it's not a finished product. This is, in fact, the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. The Chachamim disagree. The law regarding Reish's Hagez, giving one certain percentage of one's shearings to the Kohen, requires shearing five ewes of one and a half mana. White and wool can combine to make up the minimum combined amount. According to Rava, untangling wool, cleaning by hand, does not constitute a change. Combing does. There's a third opinion in the Gemara, which is bleaching with sulfur is a change. Washing is not. Dyeing wool. If the dye can be removed by way of a detergent, it is not a change. A dye such as indigo that cannot be removed even with a strong detergent is considered a change and does not combine to the requisite amount for racious hagez.